Academy Museum presents a history of the Navy in 100 objects. Across the Severn River from the Naval Academy is Greenbury Point, which, as we have discussed previously, served as the first official naval air station. 1905 Naval Academy graduate John Towers, Naval Aviator No. 3, was placed in charge of standing up the aviation unit at Annapolis in the fall of 1911, and over the next three decades, would help oversee the development of naval aviation technology and tactics alongside other naval aviation pioneers like Battle of Midway hero Admiral Mitcher, another Naval Academy graduate. In 1912, Towers was nearly killed in an accident when a sudden downdraft caused Ensign Billingsley, pilot of the aircraft Towers was riding in, to be thrown from his plane along with Towers. Towers was able to hang on to a strut as the plane went down in the Chesapeake Bay. This incident led to the installation of seatbelts in aircraft. As the number of naval aviators continued to multiply rapidly prior to and during World War I, the size of the aircraft they were piloting was also rapidly expanding. Since the very first naval aircraft, the Navy had focused extensively on float planes able to take off from and land on the water. Recall that when we talked about mine warfare in previous episodes, we discussed the havoc that German submarines were creating in merchant shipping during World War I. This created significant difficulties in shipping aircraft across the ocean. So the Navy, Glenn Curtis, and Curtis's close friend John Towers, resolved to build large enough flying boats that they would be able to make the crossing on their own. Our object today is a small piece of fabric and metal piping that looks like a large postage stamp, and it was part of NC-4, one of the largest flying boats designed and built by Curtis, and also one of the largest biplanes ever produced. It was one of ten such planes produced during the last days of World War I, weighing nearly 15,000 pounds, and with a 126-foot wingspan, the craft was designed to carry massive payloads and to fly long distances. Although the planes never saw combat because World War I ended prior to their operational use. A now little known fact is that Charles Lindbergh and his plane, the Spirit of St. Louis, were not the first to cross the Atlantic. Rather, that honor belongs to NC 4, which was one of three such planes that set out in May of 1919 to attempt the crossing. There were actually four original aircraft but NC-2 was scrapped early on in the mission in order to provide spare parts for the other aircraft. The crews, pilots, and planners of the expedition were composed of a veritable who's who of early naval aviation. Future polar aviator Richard Byrd helped plan the route. Mitcher and Towers were both pilots and commanders, and several other aviation innovators were essential crew members and planners. Leaving on May 8, 1919 from Long Island, New York, the planes flew a route via Newfoundland and then the Azores across the Atlantic. Forced down by mechanical problems and bad weather, two of the planes, one piloted by Mitcher and the other by Towers, were forced to land in the ocean. NC-4, however, guided by an unbroken line of American warships every 50 miles across the Atlantic, finally completed the trip arriving in Lisbon, Portugal on May 27th. Heroes in both Europe and the United States, the crew returned home having been the first to cross the Atlantic. Soon after, British pilots John Alcock and Arthur Brown made the first non-stop flight across the Atlantic, and in 1927, Charles Lindbergh made his historic solo New York to Paris flight. But the honor of first to cross remains firmly in the possession of an intrepid crew of early United States naval aviators and their early flying boat. Lindbergh himself said of the daring mission, I had a better chance of reaching Europe in the spirit of St. Louis 
than the NC boats had of reaching the Azores. I had a more reliable type of engine, improved instruments, and a continent instead of an island for a target. It was skill, determination, and a hard-working crew that carried the NC-4 to the completion of the first transatlantic flight. The 100 Objects Facebook page contains a link to the digitized version of the commemorative 50-year anniversary book, published in 1969 by the Navy and the National Air and Space Museum. And now, for a little bit more about our object today, we go to Jim Cheevers, Senior Curator of the Naval Academy Museum. The Naval Academy Museum is very proud to have a, at least a small piece of a famous aircraft known as the NC-4. It was one of four naval aircraft in the spring of 1919 uh, that made the first transatlantic flight. Um, many people don't recall this because, of course, eight years later, Mr. Lindbergh got all the publicity for making the first uh, transatlantic solo flight. But in 1919, uh, the Navy uh, left uh, four aircraft, naval aircraft left from Long Island. Uh, they landed in Newfoundland and then in the Azores. Uh, and the NC-4, the only one of the four that made it the entire way, uh, eventually landed in late May uh, in Plymouth, England. Uh, these were crewed by naval aviators who were trained here at the first naval aviation camp, uh, which was across the Severn River from the Naval Academy here in Annapolis, Maryland. Uh, so we're very proud to boast that we have uh, the first naval air station here. And a lot of firsts in naval aviation uh, occurred here uh, in Annapolis uh, from flights off Greenberry Point of both Wright Brother and Curtis aircraft uh, between 1911 and 1913, uh, leading up to the uh, NC flights, flights after World War I. Uh, of course, the entire NC-4 survives today. I can recall on the 50th anniversary of the flight, it being on, on exhibit in the mall in Washington. And today it is inside in the wonderful Naval Aviation Museum at Pensacola, Florida.